So now we are going to have our youth forum and this would be chaired by Dr. Norma Nigaku. So Dr. Nigaku, it's over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Do I have, um, for the youth forum, you will have Mr. Orfeo Roberts. And, yes, um, sir, I am here. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's an impressive picture. <laughs> yeah, because my video doesn't want to go on. So the only thing I could put was a picture. Okay, okay, all right. Yes. Okay, you're you're going to do now. Mr. Roberts is a he's a bachelor. He has a bachelor's of sociology from Anton de Combe University of Suriname, and he is currently in customer service. And he's very active in his community, um, doing a lot of the sociological type work. Um, in addition, to, in, in addition to being in the service industry, yes. now, Mr. Roberts is going to give us a talk about the role and meaning of complex taboos and concepts in the life of the local residents of the neighborhood of Sapphire's Lust in Suriname. Yes. Right? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Well, without uh, any further waste of time, let us get Mr. Roberts um, online and with the presentation. Yes. Sharing my screen now, can everybody see it? Yes. Mm. Wait, I have to yep. get it big. Yes. So good mm. afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Um, my presentation is going to go about Trefu and China, which are taboo concepts in the basically African Afro Surinamese taboo concepts. Um, Trefu and China also were my subject, my thesis subject. So I graduated university on this presentation to say. So um, without any further ado, so I will be having an introduction into the subjects of literature study, methodology, the results, and the conclusion. So to introduce this subject, these concepts is basically a given. I have been uh, approached by Ms. Kirti Algu, who was the former uh, presenter in the, for, uh, yeah, the segment before. Um, and my, my subjects come out of a bigger research, which have been done by a, a whole lot of people who also have been my mentors and guides throughout my thesis um, work, basically. The main goal of this research was to reconstruct the life of leprosy patients in Suriname. The taboo concepts Trevo and China were found um, with these leprosy patients because they used them as, well, basically they, 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 they use these taboos, taboo concepts as reasons for why they got their leprosy sickness. Um, the Trefu taboo concept, which originated from Jewish and African influences, basically Trefu, is the, the word, is how you pronounce it. Um, it there, it's basically out of the Hebrew word tarefa. Um, I'm not sure if there's any English pronunciation for that word, but it's tarefa. And because Jewish people and African people came together, they used that same word to basically explain similar 
concepts. So the intercultural contact between those two groups have changed the word from terefa, which was um, basically Jewish, into trefu. And how we say it in Saranantongo, it would be trefu with the F-U, the trefu with F-U instead of the trefu with O-E. Um, and it's limited to the city of Paramaribo. Now, um, there's a lot of trefus. Basically, you have the individu individual personal trefu and the non-individual trefu. Now, the trefu, you can get it by, um, it's basically the trefu originates by cause. So you can get a trefu by experience, which basically means if you eat something and you get a rash, a sickness, that's how you know said food or yeah, said food is your trefu, basically a taboo you are not supposed to eat. Um, you have the trefu inherited from the father, the trefu you get through dreams. So you would basically, for example, you would dream that a cow would be running after you, which means you're not supposed to eat the meat of a cow. Um, then you have authority of trefu experts. Basically, trefu experts means the somebody who is who knows who has knowledge of trefu would basically tell you what your trefu is, what your personal taboo is, um, and so on. The trefu on the appearance of symptoms of leprosy. So if your leprosy sickness would look like a certain type of food it means said food would be your trio food on grounds of strong dislike says that if you eat something or you do not like a certain type of food, it's your taboo. Also based on the use of medicine, you use some type of medicine, you get a result, a negative result, then that medicine is your trio food. And consuming foods, basically try trio food would be you would eat various foods to see if something happens to you. So you will go around and try certain types of food to see if you have any negative um, results from those types of food. Then you have the non-individual food, but would be basically trefu for tabu food. So tabu food would be, if you think in the terms of halal or haram, so no pork, um, basically no um, in Sranatungo, we would say um, grat fisi, so no fish that don't have so unskilled fish, basically. And the second one would be the general trefu, where the person would avoid pretty much anything edible in the hopes of getting better. So you don't know what the problem is, so you avoid anything that's edible, basically. Now, China concept, on the other hand, has its origins from Af Africa, the Luango region, and it came with the slave trade to Suriname. Now, the China compared to the Trefu, Trefu is only focused on a food taboo, so something you are not allowed to eat. But the China has something you are not allowed to eat. It concerns an animal. Um, sometimes a plant, but it also includes a forbidden place or a forbidden act. So um, you're not supposed to eat a certain type of food. You're not to touch, kill, or harm any certain type of animal. You're not supposed to go to a place or do uh, some type of act, which will cause you to get a negative result. Now you have multiple types of chinas. And the first one would be the inheritable one. So it's hereditary. You get that from your father, like the trefu. You have the neseki china or nasi, which basically means you get a china by um, reincarnation. It would be something reincarnated um, in, with you, into you, basically. Then you have the third one, which is linked to a protectant. You can think in terms of a medallion, some type of um, something to keep you safe. It's also called a tapu. Uh, and then at last you have the China by own observation, 
where you would look and see what happens to you if you go to a place or you do something or you you eat some type of food you touch an animal hurt or harm it in any way that's how you would know that setting animal or place it's your china now my the scientific relevance for my um, study was the fact that china and tofu have been researched um by a few yeah not a lot of researchers there's not a lot of info and uh, literature about those two concepts and it's mostly it has a european view so it's not it's from the outside in instead of with from the people who experience trefu and china so i used my research to in some points kind of correct what was said wrong or add to it what was said correctly or if need be change certain points now my research question is what is the role and meaning of the concepts in the daily life of the residents from the age 16 and older in the neighborhood of sofia's lus so i was strictly looking at what are the role and meaning of these two concepts today. So not 100 years ago when they were researched before, but today. Um, yes, so how I got about my research, I basically used as a case study based on, a, based on mixed method design and using the constructive theory, the, uh, constructed grounded theory approach of Kathy Charmas. Why? Because within all of those mixed method um, grounded theories, I have found that Kathy Charmas, um, you are basically allowed to still dive into the literature because basically grounded theory, the, everything is grounded in the research. But with her, you can you you could use literature to kind of give you an idea of like what what are we looking for. So I used Katy Charmas approach. Now I have also used explanatory design within all those multiple uh, mixed method designs, and I have done a quantitative research first. Use that to basically prepare me for the qualitative interviews. And at last I interpret all my research combined and then gave my conclusions. Um, yes, for my quantitative research, I chose a survey and that was generally just to get the available knowledge about these two concepts in the neighborhood. Um, it's basically a sample of 600 uh, plus households, but we rounded it down to 600, of which I took a systematic, uh, I systematically selected um, every 10 houses. So I have 60 surveys, basically. I processed process this data through um, SPSS um, program, like you basically do for quantitative um, analysis. For my qual uh, qualitative part of the research, I did in-depth um, interviews. And basically, I just brought the whole neighborhood, those 60 households within a careful, yeah, careful place barrier, 600 households. And then I just got 10 respondents out of all those 600. Um, by asking the, my respondents from my surveys, um, did a few, con, uh, basically had a few conversations with the residents. I walked through the neighborhood, drove on bikes in the car, just to get a good idea of who I can basically go for an interview and get uh, the best out of it. So for the processing of my in-depth interviews, I use the Atlast TI software, which was a handful. And the key concepts in within my whole research were knowledge. And that was the, basically 
divine in being aware to, or to some extent aware of culture, characteristic histories, value, beliefs, and behavior with regard to Trevu, China, Trevu and China within one's own ethnical group or anything you've heard for, from any other ethnicity or cultural group. So my definition for knowledge was pretty broad. It, so not to kind of exclude um, important, basically important knowledge, important information I would have missed if I made it very small. Now, the transfer of knowledge is also a important concept because Trefu and China are concepts that are passed on from generation to generation. So it was important, it was an important concept to see the differences between um, the older generation and the young, younger generations. That's why also I have an age um, gap between 16 and older. Knowledge transfer was divided in the process by which knowledge, ideas, and experience pass on, pass from parents to their children. So this is somewhat an idea of Sophia's list. On your left, you would see this is the whole neighborhood. So within these four um, roads, I did my research. It's basically 600 households within these four um, streets, basically. And then you have the some of the residents of the neighborhood and the kids. So my the results for my for my research, the statistical research to start with. So I had predominantly women uh, more than men. It's like 73% women and the oldest being 77 years old and the youngest 16. The average age is 35 years. And in the in-depth interview, it was an age gap from 21 to 71. So predominantly Creole people followed by Maroons. And then you have a mix of Japanese, um, Hindustani people and all the mixing mixes between all those um, ethnicities. So the majority of my res uh, respondents are Christians. It's 89.5% uh, of them were Christians and the interview nine versus one. More than a half have received general secondary or higher professional or university education and almost half is employed. Uh, mostly unmarried, uh, unmarried uh, basically couples in within those households I have researched and about 10% live together and 13% are married. No. What I have found out is that ge generally everybody knows about Trefu. Basically, they all have heard about it. They know about it to some extent. But Creoles know, Creole people know a lot more about Trefu and the Maroon, so the Saramakan and the Okaners, they know a lot more about China. Now, the knowledge is generally passed from one generation to the other. And basically for the Maroon and the Creole, it was more important to have knowledge of these two concepts, not so much um, for the other groups. Now, that being said, it's also that the Creoles and the Maroon, they believe that this is important knowledge that the younger generation should know. In terms of education, um, but if we look at the Maroons, Alkaners are mostly low skilled and excluded from a label market. And they, they are not common to have uh, education of some type, which is what I see was missing. But the Alkaners, they believe more than the Saramakaners between, um, in a relationship between leprosy and the China and the Trefu. 
So I said in the beginning that the trifo and the china came from research done from a leprosy patient. And that's because the leprosy patients thought that they got the sickness because, because of their china and trifo. They ate something or did something they were not supposed to do. Well, within my research, only the alpaners more believe more than everybody else that there's still a link between leprosy and uh, China and Trefu. Now, um, I furthermore, I have found out that China and Trefu, being what it was 100 years ago, has evolved. So there's, I have seen some kind of fusion, or, or we could say Trina and Trefu are becoming identical. I have it is the return from Trefu into China. Why? Because the African well, this, yeah, within slavery, China came from Africa. It came into Suriname. And because of the, the meeting of cultures within Suriname, and we'll keep it to the city of Paramaribo, the pronunciation from China went to Trefu because the tarefa of the, well, the Jewish people was the most common thing close to the China. So, China then transferred into Trefu, well, into Tarefa and was spoken out as Trefu, which is why I could sense that the Trefu is going back into the original form, the China. Given that Trefu only focuses on the food and China on the food plus everything else. Now, I've also found that there's some substantive change within Trefu and China because they have new elements in this day and age. We have Trefus that apply to Afri um, the Winti, the spiritual aspects. It's yeah, the Winti religion in Suriname now, which also includes China. And this makes the China and the Trefu a container understanding. The way people grasp those concepts now, they take everything that kind of seems, feels like a Trefu or a China, and they put everything under one name, Trina or Trefu. So now we have river Trefus. You are not allowed to cross certain rivers. You're not to go to certain places. You're not allowed to throw certain stuff on your yard or do certain stuff. You have Trefus linked to sexual intercourse um, linked to times from coming home. So there's certain things you are not allowed to do, which was not in the original China and Trefu, but in this day and age, this is what the people believe now. And that's what they put under the name China or Trefu. And also the general menstruation Trefu, which from what I have gathered applies to everybody everywhere. Now, I've also found out that there's less, less interest among younger people. The younger the person, the less relevant they found Trefu and China to be. And fewer people believe in a cause, uh, basically a link between Trefu and leprosy. Like I said before, it was also the O'Connors that believe that if you cross or defy your trefu, you will be punished by getting leprosy as a result. Now, to add to this, I have gathered there is leprosy dressy, which is something big in its own. That means you cannot only get leprosy, um, basically fire, um, china or trefu, or it's um, conta fire contagion, no, you can also apply some type of medicine, which you will get from, I would say, cultural norms. It would be preparated and you would basically be able to give somebody leprosy in some sense. Now, um, ethnicity, age, and religion have been the most important factors in explaining the differences between the uh, Maroons, Creoles, and the other ethnic groups. And this, these three um, basically influence the knowledge of Trevu and China within the different generation. So it also influenced how, 
how and what meaning they give to Trevu and China. Also how they experience the China and Trevu this day and age. Now, as a conclusion, my conclusion is the Trina and China of to, the Trevu and China of today are associated with a dynamic ethnic or religious commitment to and respect of cultural beliefs. Also the action values and norms for food, animal plants, environmental factors in nature and certain customs, certain cultural customs to be precise. Now, these cultural concepts Trevu and China are still passed on from generation to generation, but now it's partly to the fusion of ethnic groups, not only where it basically originated from. Um, that's why you have the new element. Now they're further maintained and at the same time adapted in, in and to the modern era. Okay, what also need to add is that China and Trevu are, see, like I said, there were um, the younger, the less important, which kind of gave me an idea or a feeling that China and Trevu might die down along the way because the more it's being passed on, the less relevant it seems to be. So uh, I might need to do future research to basically conclude that. But this is the end of my pre presentation and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Robert. I think that was, that was very fascinating. I, I, um, I think that, uh, Dr. Cambridge mentioned that this, we use the word kina in, yeah, in, kina. Yes. in the end. So, so that, that is a responsive chord. Um, are there any questions um, from for Mr. Robert from the from the audience? If you could just uh, unmute and then um, go ahead, Mr. El Elton. Good afternoon. I am aware of this kina issue. Now, for Mr. Robert, have you been able to, apart from the research that responses that people gave you, have you been able to actually see the effect of this kina, as we call it in Ghana? Because like, for instance, you eat on scale fish, some people, they say it, it brings skin, brings on skin rashes. Have you been able to done that sort of research to, to see the effect if any of the people, I mean, you, you will not want to ask somebody to eat on scale fish if you know it will bring on a skin, skin rash, but have you in your time seen any impact of such, the effect of such things happening? Yes, if I, if I may answer, yes. I have seen um, the impact of the kina or tofu. I see Mr. Fiber Cambridge, he said kina with a double N. Here we have it with a single N and it also means uh, a, 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 basically a rest day. So a day you don't do anything. I have seen um, that the results of basically, yeah, um, eating the china and some people get a rashes. Some of them get pimples along the, the mouth. And moreover, it would be more of something in the type of a, a enzyme, like uh, like a rash. But when you scratch it, it kind of comes off white. What is the what is the relationship, if any, between the the the, the, the an allergy? If one says you have an allergy which yes. would be more like if you're allergic to, like uh, some people can't eat pumpkin. Some people say chikina. Some people can't eat nuts, peanuts. Yes, but so that's a, that's a very, very, very great question. Um, 
I will answer it with one uh, with something one of my respondents say. Uh, well, most a few of them. It's more that uh, allergy is something that your your body cannot basically fight against. It's something um, biological, but the kina and trefu is something cultural. So you can go to the doctor to get medication for an allergy, but you cannot go to the doctor for something that it's cultural, something that's passed on. That's something you get, um, basically that's not biological in some sense. I, I think I understand. For example, if I have, um, if a kinner, if one of my kinners says I can't eat pumpkin, doesn't yeah. matter medication I take, I can't eat pumpkin. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> Or unscaled fish, right? Or okay. unscaled fish, yes. Or other things, yes. Good, excellent. For, and uh, more questions for, um, I find it very fascinating actually, the, the, um, the topic. Uh, again, to Mr. Roberts, I am aware that, for instance, as Dr. Nigaki just said, he had a kina, or, uh, or he has a kina for pumpkins. Yes. Growing up, I was debarred from eating pumpkin, uh, okra, on scale fish, and yes. Yes. But today, I eat pumpkin. I eat on um, okra, not the fish, not the pork. Yes. I'm not testing them. But, you know, I, you said that medication, it, I feel that some people can't grow out of the kina. And also, it is possible that it, as uh, Dr. Nigaki may have alluded, it might be similar to the allergy in some way because you are aller you're allergic to it. Maybe some, some chemical reaction within your system is causing these things. And if you can annulate that chemical reaction, then it may be well. Mm -hmm. I do eat okra, but not very often, once in a while, no, a little, but pumpkin, I eat it whenever it's there. Yes. Elton, you were just testing, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you mean, I yes. get what you mean. Ms. Boston, I think you, you have your hand up, please unmute and go. Okay, good afternoon, um, Mr. Robert. Afternoon. Yes, I am wondering within my generation, my descendants, um, they, there's a particular color that they say if you wear that color, it you get bad luck. And they talk about experiences where, you know, wearing that color brought them bad luck. Somebody died, where most times it resulted in death. I'm yes. wondering if this is similar to what you were searching, because while this is not an algae rash, um, a number of them within my generation would talk about wearing like for instance, baby blue and people dying on the day that they wore that blue, right? So That's I'm wondering right. if this is something that's similar or if you've ever come across something like this in the process. So I have not come across anything that says about wearing a color, but if you look at it in the sense of it not being a trefu, which is only focused on something edible, a food, but if you look at it in terms of a china, where you have an unforbidden act. So I would think it would be the act of that you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to wear yellow per se or red. So it would, I would place it under it being a china or kina, like they say. All right, thank you, Mr. Robert. You're Ms. Harris, I see your, your hand is up. Yes, good afternoon. Um, growing up in a culture, we were told as um, if there are twins in a family that you don't give the twins certain types of food to eat yes, because um, um, of, of, of allergies and rashes and um, things like that. Yes. And um, we have several twins within our um, family. So, but I've known that as children, want they could not eat certain foods 
because it brought out rashes and things like that. But as they grew into adults, we found that while one could have um, started to eat certain foods and had no reaction, another one couldn't use the foods because that one had the reaction. So um, I don't know, you know, of what it is, but we grew up with the culture of that. And so with other twins coming up, you avoid certain foods because you didn't want the same things to happen. Yes. And then I've known of another case where um, another family member ate pork at a neighbor and had a very, very um, allergic reaction. And so stayed away from it. But now his children, you don't give it to his children because of the fear that they will have the same reaction. So I know that in, with some things, while some persons it may you know, be a myth, in some yes. families, it's the reality. Because mm -hmm. exactly. we uh, you know, we've experienced it within you know, our, um, our generation. Yes. Good. Within my research, I have also a met uh, a respondent that has twins, and they are not allowed to eat um, pumpkin. That's their their trefu. They're not allowed to eat pumpkin. And since we're on the being children, also children are not allowed um, outside after six. Or when you carry them, they're not supposed to look behind you. You have to make sure they look in front. And on the on staying at the twins, you well, from what I gather is that you have to sometimes have to get a third child to kind of act like a protection for those twin for the twins because twins are vulnerable to like yeah spiritual let's say spiritual acts within the Trefu and Tina spectrum. That is what I have gathered. Um, during their research. Dr. Cambridge, I see your hand is up. Thank you so very much, um, Norman. Thank you very much, um, Orfeo. And this is a question, I can't remember which African ethnic group you associated Tina with. And what I'm trying to find out is Tina a subgroup of the Yoruba um, culture and civilization. I'm wondering if we are looking at an element a, 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 an element of uh, spirituality that is uh, of a large significant um, from, from Africa? Is it of a Bantu origin? Is it Yoruba? Uh, because of these commonalities, I see Jillian is touching on some similarities in the, among the Gullah Gitche. So the question really is, have you been able to associate the China idea with a larger African cosmology and spirituality um, from West Africa, for example. So to answer your question, um, I have not. Um, this is strictly based from the thesis research. I, the only thing I have is the, like the link to the Luango region, but a specific um, cultural group within that region. Um, you mentioned Yoruba, that's something I have heard very often in Suriname, but I can speak on that as to be the place or one of the places where the China, um, which basically is known over the world as Kina, Sina, China, and has various ways of being written down, that kind of comes, basically concludes to the same thing, but I have not been able to pinpoint an exact origin, African origin for that concept. I, I, I thank you very much. And the reason I asked that, I just saw a couple of weeks ago, um, a documentary called Bigger, Bigger Than Africa, uh, yes. which was about the Yoruba presence in the Americas. And um, so I, I'm, I'm currently just trying, so fascinated that I'm trying to find these um, connections. You know, the Aku, Oku people in Guyana, that's Yoruba. And um, so, uh, thanks for this clue. Uh, you have uh, you have opened another uh, path for interrogation. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, sir. Thank you for the question. So this is a very very informative um, uh, session, and I think what it what it allows us to to understand is that there's a lot that we don't know. Yes. And a lot 
things <laughs> a lot that we should be paying attention to. It also emphasizes the point that the younger generation, um, by not paying attention to things, are becoming more vulnerable, exactly. right? And 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 don't right. And and, uh, and the thing is, if if somebody knows something and you don't know it, then for example, if I'm allergic, if I know that there's an allergy to peanuts and you may be allergic to peanuts, I could kill yeah. you easily. Right? Exactly. And you won't know. You will just die. <laughs> so, yes. so knowledge is very important for us for us to pass on. And I think it's yes. critical that we that we that we pay attention to knowledge transfer. Yeah. Doctor yeah. Roth, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention an observation that I noticed in the Samaka village in the um, Boko Prondo region is that before uh, a, a spiritual ritual, they would rub something that looked to me like chalk on their skin. They said this is as was protection during the ceremony. But when you start to mention the, 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 about the skin rashes because that that white thing remains on their skin for for weeks after and so i was wondering it looks like they um it looks like the soil in the area like if they take the soil from different parts of the area I, it looks to me like white chalk but the soil in the area is also white the, the actual clay so i was just wondering if that is related to anything that you have said sorry <laughs> I had to lower my hand. So for, for these two concepts, not per se, I think the next presentation that's going to be um, presented by Mr. Narden might give you uh, some insight within that because the white chalk makes me think of something we call uh, Pemba uh, in Suriname, which is mostly used in spiritual practices. So I think, um, Mr. Narden would be able to give you more information on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions for Mr. Robert? If not, we will thank you very much for the presentation. Very stimulating. And um, is, is, is Mr. Is speaker on i i don't see his, his yes good day everyone i am here you are here okay okay very good well can you then uh since you are touching on spirituality and we're right moving right into it could you just um take the floor the floor is yours just on you let me see is my screen sharing with you all? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes. Good day, everyone. I am Nathaniel Narden. I am a past graduate of the Anthony.com University of Suriname. And uh, today, this session is putting my English to test. So I will also learn you all some Surinamese words. Um, to start with, one of them is Majausu. Majausu is a word that originates in the language, the spiritual uh, language, Kumanti, and that means teachings of the ancestors. I did a qualitative study of the different methods of a Dumang. A Dumang is a spiritual healer from uh, Akata and Tinakondre while driving away a Bakru. Take a look with me. Um, Vinti. Vinti is a spiritual religion, a religion or spiritual belief in Suriname. And Vinti is an African-American religion centered on the belief in personified supernatural beings who can possess a person and disable the consciousness after which they can reveal the past, present, and the future and can cure diseases of a supernatural nature. Um, the Dumang, as I said before, is a spiritual healer. And those are going into trends, being used as a medium where the spirits are demigods or gods. Uh, they take uh, over and they guide them through the process of driving away the Bakru in this matter. The Bakru is an entity that 
can take over someone's mind and body. When taken over, it makes a person do crazy things or even be, uh, bring physical and mental illness. When the Dumang determines through consult that someone is possessed by a Bakru, there are methods used to expel the Bakru from the body. And these methods may vary from a spiritual healer, a Dumang, to a Dumang, depending on the foreknowledge of uh, that Dumang or spiritual healer, which ancestral spirit or Vinti is leading in that method. The introduction, area of concern. There is no unambiguous method in driving away the Bakru. The Bakru uses diverse methods to drive away. And that was for me a, a area of concern to seek in and to know why is there no an unambiguous method in driving away such a entity. A research question is just how does the method of a Dumang A from a kata kondre, a kondre is a kondre is a piece of land where vinti practices are being held or, or taken place. Uh, from Dumang B, from Tina Kondre in driving away the Baku. The aim of this research is to, pro uh, to provide insight into the method of treatment of the phenomenon of the Yagi Baku. Yagi Baku is just is a Surinamese term, and that means uh, driving away the Baku. Uh, by comparing the methods of those two spiritual healers uh, from different countries. The data collection methods I use for my research or study were uh, participant observation, interviews, and case study. Uh, to talk or to give a few of my uh, experiences by, uh, with participant observation, at one of the congress, I had to cleanse myself before gaining knowledge because knowledge there was sacred. I had I was put to test. I had to sleep in the dark. I had to go into one of these uh, dofo. The dofo is a, a house of the spiritual healer where the spirits rest. And I had to kill uh, or not kill. I had to put out five candles. That was for me a test to see if I was good hearted or if I was worthy enough to gain information. Uh, the five candles, three of the candles went out by putting it out with my fingers, but two of the candles didn't want to go out. So I didn't know why. I, I just talked in, in uh, the room and then I tried it again and the other two candles went out. So I went out the door and the Duman was standing uh, right outside of the room waiting to know if all five candles went out. So he asked me, did you put out all the five candles? I told him yes. And from that moment on, I uh, was worthy enough to, to gain uh, information from Akata Kondre. That was, that was Akata Kondre. The Bakru. The Bakru is an entity that is usually described as a dwarf-like creature or child with a big head. That's in liter uh, literature. The two Dumang also describe the Bakru as a dwarf-like creature, uh, sometimes more a silhouette form uh, with a big head, sometimes with big feet, or sometimes with one half wood and the other half flesh. The Bakru is also called uh, Moatia in stories of Anansi. Anansi is a African uh, spider god who possesses a lot of knowledge. And Moatia is more likely described in uh, those fairy tales or, or stories of Anansi as a fairy, the ones we know like Tinkerbell, and that is invisible with powers. Uh, the Bakru is offered uh, if the Baku is offered or, or, or bought, he can bring his owner many riches or make him wealthy. There are many types of Bakru. You have the Seni Bakru or the Visi Bakru, and those are Bakrus sent by someone to curse you or uh, when you are bewitched with a Bakru. You have the Famir Bakru or Bere Bakru. These are uh, types of bakrus that are within a family for uh, decades or centuries. 
and then you have the busi bakru the busi bakru is this uh, is the bakru that lives in uh, outside of uh, the urban areas and is more in the rural uh, rural uh, areas uh, in the bushes so to speak this is a more aggressive form of the bakru driving away the bakru i put the two condors aside so that we can take a look in uh, what are the methods or how they they do that and at akata condre they they do they begin with a luku a luku is a consult the spiritual healer takes he can use tarot cards or he can summon the vinti the vinti is the demigod or the god in akata condre the consult is done by working with tarot cards or summoning the, the vinti spirit when working with the tarot cards, the patient randomly pulls cards from the deck, and these cards can represent the situation or the, pro the, the problem. When summoning the spirit, the Duman goes in trance, as I said before, and the Vinti spirit looks into the patient's spiritual lineage to identify the problem. He then, when he has uh, identified the problem, he then puts heavy dressy, and heavy dressy is heavy medicine, that's uh, for external use. After the problem is identified, he then puts the heavy medicine to protect the patient from the back room and then to prepare the patient from driving out the back room. After the heavy, the heavy medicine, the Duman prepares a bed with natural uh, ingredients like onions, leaves, garlic, and potions like uh, Florida water or, or Pompeia. Uh, the, the heavy medicine or heavy dressy uh, is to drive out the back room. So when he uses the heavy dressy, the heavy medicine, he then uses a, he makes a water with all those natural ingredients, leaves, onion, garlic, to drive away the back room and other negativity. And when you take the, when he bathes you, when you're being washed, and, and then after that, he makes you rest, and then you get a sweetie water. The sweetie water is a sweet, sweet water. It, it smells sweet and that is more used to cleanse the patient and to boost the spiritual immune system. The beta bakru, as I said, is not drifting or uh, uh, expelled as the steni bakru or wisi bakru. The beta bakru is the one that is manifested in the family. You cannot wash or drive that one away. Why? The Berebaku, the Berebaku is bought by ancestrons, so to speak, or so said by the respondents, to work for the family, May, mainly used in slavery to help with heavy work. And the Berebaku has the right, because he, is be, he was bought by uh, someone, he has the right to take his place in the spiritual lineage of the patient or that person. The Dumang negotiates with the Berebakru through rituals by offering animals in exchange for the life of the family member or the family members. Because the Berebakru, he can um, exterminate generations of such a person who has bought uh, that type of the Bakru. In Tina Kondri, they also do the Luku, that's also the consult. But they more, I, I only saw them summon the Vinti. They don't use tarot cards or any other form of uh, to do the Luku. They also use the heavy Watra method and the Sweetie Watra method, but they didn't uh, put the heavy dressy on the patient, so to speak. They also use chickens or animals to negotiate with the beta Baku. In my case study, there are my observations in, in Tina Conre, I saw a case where someone came with uh, thick feet and he was uh, in the hospital, okay? And he, he the, the doctors couldn't help him, so he came for uh, the, the traditional help, so to speak. And the person, the, the Dumang, the spiritual healer, she took him and told him it's gonna be all right, she bait him on a termite nest and then used two types of or, or two colored chickens. One was white. She then made her heavy water and she took a white chicken, put it in the water to bait the person with that. And then after that, 
um, she ripped the white chicken open and there was no uh, sign of our blood to see uh, come out of that chicken. And then she used the black chicken again in another uh, water over the person. And then she released the black chicken in the woods. That was the method I, the, I saw with my observations at Tina Conre and Akata Conre. Now, diversity. Various initiations. The Dumang from Akata Conre, they go through an initiation process by being trained by uh, the head teacher. There's a head teacher, a head Dumang. He teaches uh, if you have the right vintis, the white gods with you, ancestral spirits, he then teaches you and makes you a Dumang and you go through oath. Um, in Tina Kondwe, the Dumang has to be spiritually gifted. You don't go through a process of training. You just have to be spiritually gifted or it has to be by birth. The knowledge to drive away or drive out the back room. Those were the two differences I saw when uh, going to do these two countries. Uh, Knowledge about the Baku and expelling of it. As I said, um, Akata Kondre, they use the heavy dressy, heavy medicine. They use the, the heavy water. And those are put together uh, in different ways. Akata Kondre does it uh, differently from Tina Kondre. And the consecutive steps to success or the, the steps they take to, to reach succession also uh, differ from uh, each other. In Akata Kondre, they, they have a other form of aftercare. They call, they, they call the, the patient, they set out a time of observation and Tina Kondre does the same as well. They call the patient when they drive out the back room to see if everything is all right. And they set out a time of observation to see if you uh, are still possessed of the Baku or not. Another difference from Akata Kondre and Tina Kondre, Akata Kondre has a Sweri and the Sweri is the main spirit of the, con the, the Kondre. It is a hierarchical, the head spirit of that Kondre. And they have as I said, different ways to consult the patient. They have tarot cards, uh, they summon the Vinti and they have this bottle with a string or, or a rope. They also use, uh, and they, they speak to the bottle to know if there is a problem with the patient. Tina Kondre, at the other hand, uses the white and the black chicken. As I said, they use the, the uh, heavy water and the sweet water. They don't use the heavy dressy, the heavy medicine. So as I said before, similarities in my conclusion, the similarities of the Dumans, they are both accountable if you are under their, their care, they are taking full responsibility of your you living there or being under their, their uh, care for that moment. And their aftercare that was also similar. I saw both Dumang call the patients and set out a time of observation to know if everything is going as uh, planned and if the patient is all right. In the conclusion, there is also a different initiation process. As I said, Akata Kondre, the initiation process is by going through a training and the true O, Tina Kondre is you have to be spiritually gifted. You have to have the, the, the Vinti spirits, so to speak. Collaborations, Akata Kondre, they use bystanders, so to speak. Let's say me and you guys would go to Akata Kondre just for observation, and a patient would come with that is possessed by a Bakuru. They would pray to God also and pray to your uh, ancestral spirits to help them in uh, uh, helping the person uh, heal, so to speak. In Tina Kondre, the Dumang has his own assistance. So let's say we would go to Tina Kondre, the Dumang wouldn't pray to God or pray to our ancestral spirits to help them in, in that matter. 
the she has her own assistants to help her uh, to to lay out all the watra, so to speak. The bakru types, Akata Kondre has the Sini Bakru and the Bere Bakru, which we also call Kunu. Kunu is a curse in the family. And Tina Kondre has the Wisi Bakru, the Busi Bakru, as I said, the one that lives in the rural areas, and the Bere Bakru, which is the family Bakru. Uh, the diversity and methods of the Dumangs to drive out the Bakru was also there, as I said there before. Mm -hmm. And for you all and me, a point of discussion, how can the Dumang best be used in the medical sector to approach disease holistically? Because let's say you are sick in you are spiritually sick or your illness is spiritually, the medical sector now doesn't approach such a disease uh, holistically by that matter. So how can we put the Dumang best uh, to use in this sector. With that being said, as my mentor said in her former presentation, Grand Tangi, which means big thanks, and I thank you all. I am awaiting your questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Arden. Thank you very much. That was very informative. But I see Dr. Cambridge is bursting and ready to go. You have a first question, Dr. Cambridge. You are, you are muted. You are muted. Dr. Cambridge, unmute yourself, please. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have a question, just I'm fascinated uh, okay. with the, the linkages and connection. The last thing I heard there was Kunu, and I'm thinking about Kunu Munu. Uh, this is just fascinating. Uh, I think the linguistics folks and uh, uh, I just want to listen. I just want to listen. Thank you. Dr. Roth, I, I see your hand is up. Yes, I just want to mention an observation and make a comment. Um, you started with the, the, the presenter actually by describing the Winte as an um, Afro-American religion. Uh, before you answer the question as to why Winte is an African-American religion, I just wanted to make my observation. Uh, in the 80s, we had um, a Guyana Suriname collaboration with the Anthony Dicom University and Marvin Sabao, so the government as well as the the university, and we had the Suriname Week in Guyana. We also had the Guyana Week in Suriname, but I'm talking about the Suriname Week in Guyana, where Andre Moses from the Kifoko Research Group brought a group of, of well, we thought performers because our parallel were performers, but as they were performing at the National Park, there was a big commo commotion on the stage. This was after Ghana had presented Comfort and other performances. So there was a big commotion on the stage as the Surinamese started to perform in the middle of the Surinamese performance, all the entire Surinamese troupe circled the person who, start, who went onto the ground. So we thought it was a performance, but it was not a performance because Andre as it was happening, and I asked Andre Moses and Maureen Sabaro, what is it? He said, they perform, well, he didn't use perform, he called the name of the person had not tied up his winte in Suriname before leaving Suriname. So he came to Guyana without tying up his winte in Suriname. And winte meant for them the spirit. He needed to tie his spirit in Suriname. So they did not mention Winti as a religion, but it was another word for spirit, whether evil or good, it was a spirit of the person that was not tied up in Suriname before traveling across the Quarantine River to Guyana. Another point I wanted to make during the Genesis of a Nation conference in Guyana, again in the 80s, 
you had presenters, both Guyana and Suriname, Guyana from the University of Guyana and Anton become uh, lecturers, researchers. And they, the Surinamese were saying, oh, the Baku came from Guyana. You had to go to Guyana to get the Baku, to bring it to Suriname. And the Guyanese were saying, no, 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 no. The Baku came from Suriname. You had to go to Suriname to get the Baku to bring it over. So those are just my three comments. Memories, okay, observations. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Doctor. <laughs> I, but I noticed the bottom line, the very last line of the slide that's on the screen, it says it equates the ancestral spirits with the Vinti. It says which ancestral spirit slash Vinti? Yes. So, exactly. so it, it, it does in fact refer to the ancestral spirit as a winty, in addition to uh, a part of a definition. But um, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to well, know if the intention to... was to say an African American religion, or if it was a South American, an African South American religion. If if the intent, because of the language difference was supposed to be a uh, South American rather than an, you know, an African South American rather than an African American. No, no, I, I, would, I, I would keep it African American because South American begins to divide it. America is all of the Americas. Thank you. All of the Americas. Thank you, Dr. Cambridge. So um, can, I, can I fill in? I don't know if Nurtanyu wants to, Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Mrs. Maria. Oh, okay. So in, in the Surinamese, I in the Surinamese context, Winti is mostly seen as an African Surinamese religion. Yeah, you can say African American or an African Surinamese religion. So the, he talks about a Surinamese context, and sometimes. Um, people related only to, to a spirit. And sometimes people say it's also a culture because it's not only a religion, but it's also a way of living yeah? with, with norms and values. So we, if, if we say that it is, a, a, it is only a spirit, then we will be diminishing um, Winti, the meaning of Winti for, for people who see Winti as a religion or who live according to this religion. So that's why he used religion. And Winti is also seen as a way of curing diseases. But, 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 this, but that's the Surinamese context. Because there's also a difference in how Maroons in Suriname see Winti and how and how uh, African, oh, yes, African is not the right word, but we also Afro use <laughs> every Surinamese, yes, every Surinamese uh, people see uh, Winti. Okay, thank you for, for that uh, clarification. I think it is, I think it's important to, uh, to listen to Mr. Arden's question about using um, using non-traditional techniques in the medical profession. You know, in the early part of the 20th century, um, basically it was shelved by the, by the Carnegie Institute, the Carnegie Mellon folks who wanted to put to destroy, in essence, and, and, and replace the holistic approach to medicines with all the synthetic things that we now have. And as a result, all of that knowledge has been sidelined, but it is still used by them to, to, to do research and come up with the synthetic uh, methods to do things. Now, I think it's very, it's very instructive that there are things that, and I said it before, we don't know. And we don't know that we don't know. 
So this kind of this kind of talk about Binti and a culture, it's a way of life. I mean, it is it is um, we need to do a lot more research and have a lot more because a lot more discussions on this because unless we go back and re and, and recover some of what is lost, we will never know about the culture of the Binti and how in fact that may be beneficial. It may be replacing all of the the permanent um, doses of medicines that you have to take for everything. And I just would like to draw this to our attention that, it, that this is, it, it is serious in terms of its implications. And it's serious because of what we don't know and what we don't know that we don't. But this again is, is importance of our history. This is very important history. I think we should have more. And you mentioned two, two conferences, Dr. Roth, in which there was this cross-cultural connection. I think we need to have more of those because we really don't know what we're missing. And the only know way we would find out is, is if we reach out to each other and explore and not be afraid and understand that we are being restricted. The medical profession has restricted the things that you're talking about, Mr. Arden by all kinds of taboos. So I think this is very valuable and it just opens the doors as Dr. Cameron said. It opens the door for all kinds of possibilities. And I think we need to consider how to move this forward in a more, in a more structured way. Just as we are moving back to holistic medicine, moving back to herbs, moving back to things that, um, that are more applicable to, to, to the cultures that we are in. And um, very good. Any any further discussion or comments from anybody else? I take silence as a as a. No, I just wanted to mention one thing. Right now in Suriname, there's drafting of a legislation to for folk folk um, folk medicine. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's being defined but they are actually drafting legislation to pass on the use, on legitimizing folk medicine. Thank you for that. I think that is very, very good because with, with the legitimacy, it means that people can become practitioners and share and not feel that they are going to be victimized, which is what happened in the early 19th, 20th century. Yeah? All of the all of the practitioners were victimized. It happened with with um, with, vood, with voodoo and voodoo. The European victimized everybody and made it Ill, illegal. You could literally go to jail for practicing herbal medicine in the states. Right. So I mean, so this is good that Suriname is 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 leading the way in this because these are real. These are real, and we just need to get our feet grounded again in the in old customs that uh, people have tried to destroy and take away from us. And we need to re revive them, we need to get to understand what is going on, what, what we don't know. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arden. Thank you, all participants. I think this oh, would thank be- you. Thank you for having me. Yep. I think both you and Mr. Robert were shared gave us some very good information and a lot of food for thought. I think um, and as we move forward, Dr. Roth, I think Dr. Cambridge, we need to think more about the next steps to including, uh, including this kind of discussion and, and more so the practice, including practitioners in, in, in the dialogue so that we can really get a sense of uh, what you have seen, what actually works, and then, of course, that get the documentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Arden, and thank you all for participating in this youth, this youth session. And thank you, youth. I mean, this is good. The youth are taking, taking the initiative and moving forward. Very meaningful, very, very meaningful um, discussion and research. Thank you. Back to you, Ms. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Norman Nigakiu. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting presentation from the young people. I've enjoyed it and I've learned a lot. And so 
I would continue reading on those topics. Very, very interesting. So thank you. Congratulations to the young researchers. And I hope that you do continue in your with your research.